This happened back in 2004 in northern Wisconsin. I was 16 at the time and out deer hunting with my dad and a friend of his, Frank. I remember this day like it was yesterday. The dialogue isn't word for word, but the idea of it is 100% accurate. As a side note, it was one day after eight people were shot, less than two hours away. My dad and I had a few different stands over an area of maybe three-fourths of a square mile. He had been hunting there for at least 10 years, and I had been going with him since I was five. Up until I was 12, the legal age to hunt with a rifle, I had just been tagging along. This particular morning, we walked to my stand first. It was about 5 a.m., so it was still dark outside. I got situated, and my dad and Frank went off to our other two stands over a ridge, maybe another 500 to 600 yards off. Sitting there in the dark is always a little eerie. Not long after my dad and Frank left, I saw a flashlight from the general direction of where they were headed, maybe 200 yards away, roughly moving my direction. I figured they forgot something from the truck or something, so I radioed to see what they were doing. We're sitting in my stand. Frank is about to head to the other one, he says. Obviously, this flashlight is someone else. But this isn't super uncommon, and I guess it really wasn't a big deal at first. Those woods do get crowded sometimes, and there is a spot to park in that general direction. I turned on my light so the other hunter could see that there is someone here. He stops. I see the light turn and go a different direction. No big deal. I ended up dozing off while it was still dark out. When I wake up, the sun is up and it's around 8am. I sit there for a little bit and radioed my dad again to see if he has heard or seen anything moving. And nothing yet. A couple gunshots off in the distance is all. I get up and go for a slow little walk to get my blood moving a bit. Not far, maybe 30 yards out back, trying not to make a sound. I come back to my stand, sit down, and take a real good look around. Nothing really going on. I finally look out to my left where I had seen the flashlight before, and I see orange. For anyone unfamiliar, hunters have to wear blaze orange during gun season. I radioed my dad once more, and Frank, to see if either of them were moving around. Dad says no, and I hear nothing from Frank. I grab the binoculars out of my backpack to see if it's Frank. It's definitely not. This guy is looking at me through his scope with his rifle aimed directly at me. This is a huge no. Massive rules we all learn in hunter's education. Never point your rifle at something you don't intend to shoot. But the dumb people still do it though. It's few and far in between, but it happens. This is why normal people use binoculars. My first thought was, what a jackass. Thing is, even with me looking at him, he doesn't even put his gun down. Now I'm starting to panic, thinking I'm going to be the next hunting murder victim. I slowly grab my rifle and get up, staying behind as many trees as I can, and I walk down a little path to the side of my stand. My stand was on this little knoll on the side of a much larger hill. I get a hold of my dad to tell him what's up. He tells me to sit tight and to stay out of sight. Obviously, as a youngster, I couldn't do that and I had to keep looking. Every time I looked, the guy was aiming in my direction. He was always standing in a different spot. Like, I would look, go back to hiding, look again, and he would be 30 yards from where he was the last time. About 10 minutes of this goes by when my dad radios me. How you doing, bud? Looking back, he was very obviously trying to keep me calm. But at the time, I thought he just wasn't taking me seriously. He's still there, but he keeps moving. I don't know what his problem is, I said. Dad told me to just keep hidden and that he'll figure it out, and that he'll be coming up near him in a minute or two. And that's when I hear the shot. I lost my shit trying to get a hold of my dad. Did he just get shot? Where the hell is he? Did he have to shoot the guy? What is going on? I sat there for maybe two to three minutes straight, and that's when I hear, all right, come out and head toward my stand. I peek up over the little knoll I was behind, and I see my dad waving from along the ridge the random guy had been on. I make the trek on over to him to see what happened. It turns out Frank was feeling a little restless and took a little stroll and ended up on the other side of that particular ridge the stranger was on, not even knowing he was there. He had knocked his radio battery loose while he was getting situated earlier in the morning and had no idea anything was even going on. The shot that I heard was actually Frank shooting a deer. Dad said as soon as Frank shot, the guy walked off away from us toward the road. We helped Frank out with his deer and decided to call it an early day. Although I was extremely nervous, the rest of the week went on with no incidents.
what I'm about to describe will sound like a cheap ass cliche movie script, but this did indeed happen. Even at home, barely anybody believes me without confirmation from the other parties involved, but buckle up, it's a long haul. Autumn 2019 in British Columbia, Canada. I am from Germany, but I spent half a year in Canada as part of my bachelor's degree. I barely got back before COVID hit. I was 22 years old at the time and the other people involved were about the same age. Another foreign student and I befriended this local Canadian student. We all had the same interests and humor and the dude became a very good friend of ours. He told us all about the local area and we spent a week in the summer with him and his father at their very remote cabin near some woods. They taught us how to handle guns there and let us shoot a lot. Then fall came and we had a lot of free time due to being finished with all of our studies. So our buddy proposed that we spend a few days at his dad's cabin, this time without his father. We went hell yeah because we could load up on booze and weed and have a great time out there. Just living the life. Three close dudes in the woods, gaming and getting wasted. Sounds great, right? After loading up all the supplies, the first three days were very calm. On the first day, just like the last time I was there, I barely slept and was generally tense. This is because I'm a naturally very paranoid guy and I often go into alert mode in situations, which is often mocked by my friends. In this case, what freaked me out the most was the fact that we were way far from civilization. And you never understand how quiet your surroundings can be until you spend some time in a remote area like this, which led to me often just standing in the dark at night, listening to the surroundings of the cabin. But after the first few days, I got less paranoid. After all, I was with friends and was constantly high and we were quite armed and dangerous. Day four came and we spent the day attempting to hunt in the woods, mostly just chilling under the trees with a beer and rifle in hand. But in the evening, it started to rain heavily. So about after an hour, we were starting to see lightning in the distance. With quite a bit of time passing between lightning and thunder, which meant the thunderstorm itself was still some time away. So we aborted our incompetent hunting attempts and started trekking back to the cabin. It took us about an hour to reach it due to it already being very dark and the rain creating unsafe footing. For context, you should know that once you spent a few days in the wilderness and haven't seen a soul other than your friends for days, you can become quite careless about your surroundings. I think you can imagine why I'm telling you that last part. So we enter the cabin. At that time, the thunderstorm was raging full on. We put away our gear and changed clothes, except for our guns. Yeah, I know, drugs and guns are a horrible combination and I wouldn't mix that shit nowadays, but we were drilled quite well by our Canadian friend's dad regarding trigger discipline, safety, etc. And man, I really miss spooning a rifle while sleeping. We cozied down in the living room at a table, started a YouTube video and began playing cards. Barely 20 minutes passed since we returned and at the time we didn't bother closing the curtains in the living room because thunderstorms are baller. So imagine that we were three guys sitting around a table, occasionally in awe at the weather outside while playing cards. In such a remote place, it is extremely dark outside. Without a full moon and clear skies, it is pitch black. The only lamps that we had are old ass vintage looking ones and dimmer than my phone screen. What comes next is how my also non-local friend has described what he saw. While sipping from his beer, another string of lightning went off. He spit it out instantly after the lightning came and screamed loudly and stood up. No words, just the sound of panic. My Canadian friend and I were instantly perplexed and looked at him. There's somebody outside, he said. He started rambling about how in that split second, the lightning illuminated the outside of the cabin. He saw a person standing a bit of distance away from the cabin, looking directly at us. Now this is what I meant when I said cliche horror story, and barely anyone believes me at first, but this did happen. My non-local friend is obviously in full on panic. His face looks anxious. This communicated to our Canadian buddy and me that this guy wasn't just messing with us. He did see somebody outside. I grabbed my rifle and pulled a boat to rack around into the chamber. I feel that warm sensation running down my spine of body releasing adrenaline. I tried to stay far away from the window and stared into the darkness outside, but I couldn't see anything. While our Canadian friend rushed into his room to grab his pistol, I start panicking even more because I realized we didn't lock the door. But really, why would we? We hadn't seen anyone in days and we were in the middle of the wilderness. So I run to lock the door. 
Our friend returns with his pistol, which he grabbed because there was a flashlight attached to it. He carefully approached the window, then changed his pace from sneaky to fast, and pushed the window open with one hand, while the other hand was aiming the handgun outside. I wish I was any good at drawing, because what we saw next when our friend turned on the flashlight was the most terrifying image I'd ever seen. It's burned into my mind. The fact that I cannot share that image with other people has been bugging me for years now. The light turns on. What we saw in that moment was a man, tall and slim, dressed in all black, with a hooded raincoat, which he has pulled over his head, almost covering his eyes. But not far away from the cabin, just a few steps away from the window. Not standing as our friend yelled earlier, but crouching, looking directly at us with clenched eyes and a terrifying little smirk on one side of his mouth. Another piece of lightning flashes, and for that moment we were all frozen. The image of what we saw must have shocked the other guys as much as it did me, because nobody said anything for a few seconds. There was a hard to explain dreadful feeling about seeing something like this. In a storm, in the middle of nowhere, a person dressed in a black raincoat is suddenly crouching so close to you and facing you. Our Canadian buddy was aiming his pistol and attached flashlight at the also frozen crouch smirking man and just yelled out, with a slight stutter and a higher pitched voice than I've ever heard from him. Get away from us or we will shoot. I guess at that moment after his eyes adjusted, the raincoat man realized that this was not just a flashlight but a gun. And I was standing next to my friend with a hunting rifle in my arm. Raincoat man's slight smirk changed to something to where I am unsure if it was shock or rage. All this was happening in less than a minute. While my friend kept on yelling and I was just frozen, the raincoat man figure turned about 90 degrees towards the nearest tree line and went from crouch to full sprint quickly. He ran away to the right side of our window. Two of us poked our head out of the window to see where exactly he was going, but with the heavy rainfall and darkness we could barely make out anything in the distance of that tree line. After a few minutes of just looking at each other in disbelief, we decided to pop off a few rounds outside the window to prove that we were for real, and to cope. When the shock wore off, we decided to call the police. They asked quite a lot of questions on the phone to describe the location of the cabin and a description of the man who just almost crept up on us, totally unsuspecting and only revealed due to lightning and luck. Due to us being in such a remote area, the cops told us it would take at least one or two hours for somebody to come out. They asked because of the weather and time if it'd be alright if they'd send someone out tomorrow to talk to us all about the details. Given how the man saw that we were armed, he probably wouldn't come back again. So we agreed. We discussed just jumping in the truck and leaving right now, but us being dumbasses were too lazy to refuel the truck. The idea of doing this now in the dark and in that heavy rain was just too frightening. I kept thinking about this guy lurking in the darkness and picking us off one by one. We spent the night sleeping in shifts. One person was awake and standing guard while the others at least attempted to sleep. When my turn came, the rain had died down. I turned off all the lights, opened a window, and just sat there in the darkness, trying to listen for any sound I could hear and looking out the windows to scan the area. Let me tell you, when you're sitting in the dark for hours in full alert mode, just trying to sit still, listen, and look around, you have a lot of time to think and reiterate what just happened. Close to the middle of the next day, two cops arrived. We had to give them a detailed report of what happened, when it happened, and we had to show them in which direction the raincoat shade ran off to. They said they will organize for a patrol to come through the woods, but that might take a while, because they needed experienced outdoorsmen, etc. Sadly, we didn't see many details of the man's face. We couldn't tell if he was young or old, only that he was tall and clean-shaven. The chances of finding who exactly that was, and finding out what the hell he was attempting to do, were very small. Though one of the officers expressed that this whole happening was deeply worrying. We left the cabin a few hours after the police left, and Canadian guy's dad insisted that we stay at his place, at least for a day, until we feel safe again. He also wanted to hear every last detail, and figured that the time has come to install cameras around the cabin. I don't remember this part for sure, but... I believe that I heard later that the dad and his brother went back to the cabin and just sat there in the dark, waiting for the raincoat man to return. But I'd never heard of any results, so I guess he must have gone hunting in other areas. I never heard from the cops again. 
Next January, I left Canada and returned home. My Canadian friend was called in for an interview a few months later, and it seemed like the police were still taking it seriously. The image of that crouched raincoat figure, completely wet and surrounded by darkness, so close to our cabin, is burned into my mind. I will most likely never forget this. I still sometimes turn off all the lights and just look out the windows in silence, trying to listen for sounds, even though I'm on the other side of the world now. We have speculated a lot about what that was. The winning theory is that this guy most certainly had sinister intentions. This did not just look like an attempt at robbery. Remember, we had dim lights on. You could see that there was somebody inside the cabin. This guy was creeping towards us in a raincoat during a thunderstorm. When my friend yelled out that he saw somebody, this guy went from walking and standing to crouching, and he went closer towards the window. I suspect that the man wanted to check what kind of victim was on the menu, and I don't really want to imagine what he had in store if there were two unarmed girls in there, in a cabin in the middle of nowhere. We didn't see any headlights passing the clearing the cabin was on. The guy also had no backpack or anything, just a raincoat and appropriate clothing. I'd bet my soul that this guy was a man on a mission who knew exactly what he was doing and what he was well prepared for. While writing this down, I also started to think about the logistics of it all. The guy must have had a camp or at least a car hidden somewhere in those woods. You can't sustain yourself out there otherwise. I also got the feeling that he either came upon the cabin during the storm itself or that he spotted us in the woods during the hunting we did before. We moved slowly while also not being shy with waving our lights around and in total pitch darkness wilderness, a proper flashlight must have been as easy to spot as the beacons of Gondor, so he might have tracked us through the woods until we reached the cabin. So my wife and I backpack and hike a lot. The more remote the place, the better. In 2015, my wife and I were in the Bitterroot Wilderness in Montana. We had been out there for two weeks on a 100 mile route trail. We'd only seen one other person, Tom. We met him on our second day and his last day out. He told us he hadn't seen or ran into anyone out there, so as far as we all knew, we were going to be alone. He told us that hunting season was weeks away, but there might be scouts out. He even said to be very careful with our food and where we eat and our scent because it's bear country and he had seen a few and even ones with cubs. He also mentioned that he had heard cougars in the distance, but that we should be okay as long as we stick together. We camped together that night, and the next morning we thanked him for his company and all the info and parted ways. For two weeks we hiked, saw some cool vistas, swam, and saw and heard wildlife, and all the stuff you'd expect to see in the back country. We didn't really think about Tom again after a few days out and hadn't seen anyone. We took the thought of being alone for granted and let our guard down. As far as other people were concerned, we were all alone out there. We are in our last few days out now, winding the trip down, sauntering back to the trailhead, just taking it all in. We find a nice flat tent site and make a fire, and some dinner, hang our food bag, and walk back to our tent for the night and pass a good night's sleep. The next morning, as backpackers do, we leave camp as early as possible to get some breakfast and coffee into us. But before we leave, I needed to use the bathroom, so I venture away from the tent site to find a suitable spot. As I'm walking around to find a place to dig my cat hole, I come up on a lumped up looking thing like a bush. I was not expecting to run into anyone out there as we had only seen one other person early on and no one else since, but I wasn't paying any attention. As I'm looking for somewhere to shit and not looking out for people, these two are in a camo blind type of rap. I didn't realize that they were there and they didn't hear or realize that I walked up on them to the last damn minute when I was right on top of them tripping over one of their legs. They scared the living shit out of me and I scared the shit out of them. When I hit the guy's leg, I startled him and he kind of jumped up, knocking their blind off for the big reveal. The guy that was on his knees had a dick in his hand, apparently blowing the other guy that is up against the tree. Now the guy on his knees is looking at me dead in the eyes with a look of, what the hell, who are you? The guy standing yells at me, WTF you doing man? They scramble and one trying to stand up, the other pulling his pants up all while the both are fighting the blind that's wrapped in between them. With me in disbelief of what I just came up on, I just stood there for what felt like forever. I stumbled over my words to find an apology and blurt out, uh, no nothing guys, sorry man, have fun. And I turned back to camp and almost a run. 
They started to yell at me to stop, but I didn't. Definitely the longest 200 yard sprint ever. So I got back to camp and my wife looked at me and instantly knew something had happened and asked what's up. I told her to grab her stuff and we hurried out there without a word. Somewhere around an hour later of sprint hiking, we had to stop. I still hadn't took a dump and I had to go. So we took a spur trail to break, snack, and I told her what happened. She told me that she was worried and that I scared her. She was scared the whole time, thinking I had been chased by a bear or a cougar or something and that it was after us. I told her it was nothing like that and that it was just two hunters hiding out blowing each other. We talked a bit about it and she asked if I thought they'd look for us. I told her I didn't really think so and that they probably left after being caught. She asked if they were upset. Yeah, I said. They yelled at me wanting to know what the heck I was doing. Should we just go back to the car and leave? She asked. No, let's just wait them out just in case they're at the trailhead waiting. Like I said, we've been out for about two weeks now and we have been making our way back and are less than a day's hike from the trailhead at this point. After a while of talking it over, we kind of just chuckled it off and we hiked onto the creek where we were going to camp for the night. We made it to camp off trail with no incident. Next morning, we wake up, break camp, and do our morning routine and hike to the trailhead. With all of that, we're not really thinking of the two hunters anymore. Well, as we got to the trailhead, we met two ladies that had been prepping breakfast. As we are walking to the parking lot, they started to chat with us with the usual backcountry questions of how long we have been out, how many miles did we do, like, did we see any bears, what did we eat? Then almost at the same time, one lady offered up some of their leftover food as the other gal starts yelling, Hey hubby, these two have been hiking up on the same trail as you and so-and-so were just out on yesterday. But they were out for two weeks. Bring them some of that real food and juice. Hubby pokes his head out of their camper to say hi. Lo and behold, it's the hunter that was against the tree. His smile faded as quick as his face turned white, then to an angry look, and he realized who he was looking at. Then his buddy turns the damn corner from their trailer to see me standing there. I start to feel the blood just strain from my body and this guy's face turned from happy-go-lucky to disbelief and fear at the sight of me. The wife then asked if we happened on their husbands out there as they were out scouting for some game yesterday. As I'm stumbling my words, they are darting their looks for me to themselves. Before I can say anything, my wife is answering, Yes, we love some real food and no we hadn't seen anyone. You guys are the first in two weeks. The wife turns to the hunters and says, you guys must have had a real good hiding spot. I think both the hunters and I had a mini heart attack. My wife and I graciously take their pancakes and sausage of all damn things. I can see both hunters quietly talking to each other, staring over at me every once in a while. I'm doing my best to avoid this situation by packing up the car. While my wife is thanking the hunters' wives for the food, both hunters, with sidearms on their hips, come up to me with a beer. The one that was on the tree kind of pushed the beer into my chest and asked if I'd seen anything out there. My heart freaking stopped. I again stumbled over my words. Uh, no. Other than, uh, some wild animals. Nothing worth writing home about. Yeah, we didn't see much either, but we are really surprised you didn't hear us last night walk through your camp. Be careful. You never know what can happen out in the middle of the woods. After a few seconds, the other one just smirks and they turn to leave with a have a safe trip home. I wasn't sure what was going to happen in that moment, so I was psyching myself for a fight. I was kind of shaken up as we were leaving the trailhead. My wife asked if I was okay and if those were the guys I had seen. My reply was, yeah, what do you think? And then she asked what they said to me. I told her I thought I was going to have to fight them, but they just gave me a beer to buy my silence. I didn't mention the passive-aggressive threat that they made about walking through our camp, though. So I take my dad's ashes up to Glacier National Park every year. I lived in Colorado when the story happened and I was headed south through Idaho after I had visited Montana. My car broke down in Selman, Idaho and a nice man helped me out. I was headed through the mountains to Boise to visit a friend. It was about a five hour drive. Before I entered the truly mountainous section of Idaho, I saw a hot spring on the side of this two lane highway along the Selman River. I decided to take a dip after the stress of having my car break down. The hot spring had a bathhouse up at the top near the road and a wheelchair ramp that went down to the area near the springs. P 
People had created little bath-shaped sections in the river that were separated by river stones. You could sit in a spot that was shaped like a hot tub so that it held the water from the hot springs while the river rushed over it. I got out of my car and I'm headed down to the hot spring. I took my dog with me, by the way, and it was twilight. About every half an hour, a car passed by. Knowing that I was alone, essentially, I took off my top. I was sitting in the hot spring and actually I even took a photo of a car approaching. The car pulled up next to mine in front of the bathhouse. It was a truck with three men in it. Seamlessly, one man got out of the driver's side and two men got out of the passenger side and were covered in black heavy gear. It looked like hunters to me. I couldn't see the expressions on their faces. The driver headed down the wheelchair ramp towards me, not hesitating. He took big long strides and I recognized there was danger. The two passengers from the other side of the car headed down the steep bank along the wheelchair ramp, taking a shortcut. So, I was sort of stuck in between both parties. I hid and dressed myself under the water while my dog growled. He never growls though. I've only heard him growl all of twice in my life and this was the second time. The driver kept on walking towards me and he walked out onto the rocks into the river, continuously walking towards me even though he was covered in heavy gear that could get him waterlogged if he fell in the river. The other two passengers from the side of the car were also walking out on the rocks, directly in front of me. The driver got so close that I had to grab my dog before he lashed out at the driver. I was freaking out. The man was walking out onto the stone so that he could reach me. He was not hesitating and I couldn't see his face. I grabbed my phone, my keys, and my clothes. I dragged my dog in between the two parties with my heart in my ears. The driver would not stop turned around very quickly making an arc coming for me still he was still taking big strides the passengers were walking towards me as well i was trapped in between them i ran up the bank dragging my dog pretty much by his collar all the way into my car the only way that i could get into my car without them grabbing me was by throwing my dog into the back and lunging myself in the passenger side door of my car I threw my keys into the ignition and turned them right when the men were walking up between my car and their car. I happened to hit the lock button on the door right when they walked up. Before anything else happened, or before I saw their faces, I ended up throwing myself into the driver's seat, reversing my car, and hightailing it out of there. I drove about 20 minutes down the road, and I crossed the river on a bridge, and I hid my car behind a bank near other campers. It was well hidden from the main road campers were looking at me wondering what was going on but i just sat and waited another 10 minutes passed by and lo and behold the truck drove by the hunters were looking for me i managed to wait another half an hour and then drove up to the mountains over to boise and into safety <laughs>